You know, I started out as a figurative painter. So I'm one of the few people that's gone from figuration all the way through to abstraction, which you can see in this exhibition. Usually people now start with abstraction or technological issues and then go from there. So my journey is like Kandinsky. I don't think my paintings are really all that abstract. I never thought they were. The stripe fascinated me because of its commonality. And I got it from a trip to Morocco. When I painted the stripes later on in my life, I started giving them the body and personality that I would have given an arm or a leg or a chair when I was a figurative painter. It makes a reference to landscape. It references it as a metaphor. Scully, het werk van hem, dat kende ik eigenlijk van een aantal glorieuze ontmoetingen, zal ik het maar noemen, dat ik steeds één enkel werk eh, tegenkwam in, in een groot museum, meestal in Amerika. Elke keer stond ik ervoor en kon ik mezelf eigenlijk bijna niet toegeven dat ik het goed vond. Ik, ik wilde het eigenlijk niet goed vinden. Misschien vond ik het alleen te mooi, dat, dat het bijna moeiteloos gemaakt leek te zijn. Het kwam eigenlijk pas bij mij binnen toen ik toevallig een keer in Zuid-Frankrijk op vakantie een, een, een sculptuurpark kwam, binnenkwam met Chateau Lacoste, een aanbeveling voor iedereen. En daar stond een enorm, ja, bijna kolosachtig uh, sculptuur van hem, gemaakt uit brokken natuursteen waarvan de onderlinge kleuren eigenlijk vergelijkbaar waren met het soort schilderijen als we hier hebben hangen in de serie Doric, stapelingen. In die steen zat leven en daar kon je als het ware nog in terugkijken. En dat kun je in die schilderijen van Scully ook, door die lagen heen. Toen dacht ik voor opeens, ja verrek, het is gewoon hartstikke, hartstikke goed. What I've got now is a very strong relationship to figuration in these paintings. And we were talking earlier about Willem de Kooning. And Willem de Kooning is very interesting to me. I went to America when I was a man, and de Kooning went when he was a man, when he was grown up. And his art, however American it became, always retained this humanistic quality, which you have in Europe, which I feel is very precious to me. I love my connection to Europe. Well, the Dorics are a love letter to Athens because the Persian Empire was trying to overtake the world. Yeah. And it was the Greeks that beat them back and had a, an opposing philosophy, which we have benefited from. All the Doric paintings are based on the idea of two to three, divided by three, divided again by two and three. So they are deeply um, temple-like. You have this idea clear in your head? Clear, and then I unload it. And when I make these, for example, I start <clears throat> here. I make them in three parts. They're separated because I want the, the relationship between this soft line, which is humanistic and poetic, and this disciplining cut, the nature of these two lines is very central to, the, to how you read these Doric paintings. And the inserts <clears throat> with the aluminum are just so beautiful. And um, you can interchange the inserts. This makes for a new kind of painting too. So the mechanization of these panels makes many more things possible. I got the idea really from printing. 
I started working in a print factory at 15. And this, the idea of the, the color on the metal eventually got into the paintings. I didn't know how many of them I would make. I thought I would make one. But I liked them so much I made 22. Printing is a wonderful uh, art me medium, of course. It makes communication possible and distribution of ideas possible. So <clears throat> these are made by, um, by etching on a plate that is covered in aquatint. And this is, this is um, called spit bite and you paint with acid and you leave it for a minute and you do this six times and you get this beautiful um, edge and which again contrasts to this edge and the character of the edge and the border is very profound for me because I don't like borders you know, I'm not thinking in, in rules. I'm using this thing, which is the stripe, but I'm doing everything I can with it. You just have to read it a certain way. And you have to see the attitude behind it, because content is really attitude. Now here's the thing about political art. In China, abstract art was, was illegal. It, you went to prison for it. This was about 25 years ago. And this proves that abstract art is dangerous. It's dangerous to autocracy because you, you, it makes people think. Whereas with overtly political art, you are, you are directed. Whereas with my work, you are, you are offered something that you can use. I mean, like, for example, this. This is the same thing again and again, but change, changing it. So you can imagine it changing, and that's the idea behind this. I wanted to do something to capture my son, a child who stands, of course, for all, all children, because these are not realistic portraits of him, because they're like this. And the only way I could do this was to revert to figuration. And since I have a whole history of figuration, it was easy. And what was really surprising to me is that it was like riding a bike. So I had the iPhone photo of Oshin on the beach, like this big. Yeah. And I have the black, and I just stand there and draw it out, and it takes five minutes. After I painted all these, I noticed two, well, three things. That I did this curved thing. I, I kind of drew a line around him as if I was holding him. Secondly, usually what he's doing here is in his head. It's exactly what I do. There's no space for me between what's in my head and action. And Arthur Danto said this, 
because Arthur Danto really loved me like a son. I was attacked a lot in New York, you know, as an outsider because my work is repetitious. Of course, you know, then they show their own repetitious artists. Like, I mean, is there anybody more repetitious than Barnett Newman? I have never seen an artist who, who just painted the same painting all his life. Anyway, so I'm criticized for that, criticized for being too European. And also, you know, I'm generally pretty defiant. And every time I was attacked in the press, Arthur would write a long article on me and publish it. Here is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. What's in his head yeah. is here. Isn't that nice? This is your allegory on painting. It's my allegory on painting. You're absolutely right, yeah. Ik denk dat hij net er iemand is van de generatie na de grote Amerikaanse colorfield schilders, na, na de, de pop art. Hij is net dus voor dat allemaal iets te jong geweest. Wij kenden dat, we dachten die, dat soort schilderkunst uh, uh, goed te hebben doorgrond. En wat die toevoeging dan was van hem, denk ik, is nooit echt aangevoeld hier in ons land. Uh, terwijl het toch echt een schilder puur sans is. En, Ja, het is, het is altijd overlooked, zou je kunnen zeggen. Het past er niet in een bepaalde uh, uh, helder, omschrijfbare uh, uh, ja, benadering. Het is vreemd, soms, soms gaan dat soort dingen zo. En, en uh, ik denk ook wel dat hij blij is dat nu in dit museum, waar de schilderkunst behoorlijk goed vertegenwoordigd is uh, van nu, en dat we hem ook zo mooi kunnen tonen in het daglicht waar Nederland zo bekend om is. Niet in een, in een kunstlichtzaal met mooie spotjes erop, maar echt gewoon met het barmhartige, onbarmhartige daglicht. Ja, ik ben er ontzettend trots op dat, dat, dat het voor het eerst hier is. Hè. My project, really, apart from being a great painter is to bring down the divisions in the world. So that's political after all? Yeah, I'm very political. And uh, do you know about my...